OK, so um, this is a talk I gave at RubyConf about two months ago. Uh, and it should take me about 30 to 35 minutes. Um, I know we like to heckle here. Feel free to interrupt me if you absolutely feel a need to. But there will also be plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, I'd like to start with a quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you have used Cucumber on any project, big or small? Uh, a third to a half. OK, more than I was expecting. That's cool. Um, how many have used Cucumber more than once? Most of those. Cool. Uh, and regardless of how many times you've used Cucumber before, how many of you would be willing to use it again? Oh. Not so many. <laughs> So usually when I talk about Cucumber to people, uh, I get a very strong reaction. And it's mostly uh, anti-Cucumber, um, which is kind of fun. It gives me something to, to talk about and start conversations and sometimes fights. Uh, <laughs> but um, so this, uh, this talk is sort of directly aimed at people who may have used it in the past and decided not to. Um, I hope at least to offer those people a, a different perspective and maybe even convince you to give Cucumber another try. Um, and for those of you who haven't used Cucumber, uh, you should go get the Cucumber book uh, before you start. Uh, it's a really excellent book. Uh, it covers far more than I possibly could in, in a half-hour talk. Um, but just so that you are not completely lost for the rest of this, um, I'm going to do a little tiny bit of, of Cucumber orientation. Um, Cucumber lets you describe your software uh, in a DSL called Gherkin. And because this is Ruby and we have a tendency to say DSL, when we really mean API. Um, I have to clarify that uh, when I say Gherkin is a DSL, I mean it's an actual domain-specific language with its own grammar and parser and semantics. Uh, and when I say it's a language, I don't mean a programming language. Uh, Gherkin is actually not Turing complete, and that's a feature. Uh, so anyway, Gherkin is uh, a DSL for writing acceptance tests to describe your software. Uh, and each feature of your software gets uh, its own separate Gherkin file. Uh, and this is an example feature file that I just pulled straight from the Cucumber website. Uh, a feature has one or more scenarios. Uh, a scenario has one or more steps. Those are the uh, given, when, then that you see down here at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and aside from a couple of keywords that I've highlighted here in green, uh, everything else is written in whatever natural language works for you. Uh, Gherkin's grammar is actually really simple. Uh, everything between the keyword and the end of the line uh, is basically treated as a single token by the Gherkin parser. Um, and we'll get, get to uh, a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, and so this, this format is really quite useful just as documentation uh, for what your application does. Uh, but Cucumber also lets you use these files to automate tests, uh, which is part of why the people who are uh, behind Cucumber talk a lot about executable specifications. And to go from human readable documents to uh, running tests, you have to write a bunch of step definitions. Uh, a step definition is basically a regular expression plus a blob of text, or of code, excuse me. Um, and this is how you translate between those human friendly blobs of text in the, in the Gherkin file into something that Ruby can actually execute. When Cucumber wants to run one of those steps, it takes that blob of text and it tests it against every single one of the regular expressions that you give it, that you've given it. Uh, and when it finds one that matches, it executes the associated block of code that went along with that regular expression. Uh, there's also a mechanism for taking capturing groups from the regular expression and passing them in as arguments to the block. Uh, you can see that here in the in the n at the very end. Um, and that's basically how you get interesting data from your feature files into your tests. Now, in my mind, Gherkin and Cucumber are almost two separate things. Uh, Gherkin gives you a human-friendly way to describe your software. Um, and Cucumber is responsible for processing your Gherkin files uh, and using them as a script for automating tests. Um, <clears throat> now, Cucumber as a whole can be kind of awkward. Uh, and I basically put up with Cucumber because I really like Gherkin. Um, Gherkin is a domain-specific language where the domain is talking to other humans about software. Uh, it's really free form, uh, so it lets you talk about your application's uh, domain using whatever language makes sense to you and your team. Um, if you happen to speak Klingon, you can write your specs in Klingon. Um, 
if you really hate life, you could do that. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and Gherkin has basically just enough structure to the language that it can be used to drive a lot of machinery for automating tests. But as mentioned before, Gherkin is not a programming language. Um, this is really a critically important point that can be easy to overlook when you're just starting out with Cucumber because it's a pretty big system and there's a, there's a lot of moving parts that can be overwhelming. Um, and programming languages are great, um, but one of the things that I think is a disadvantage uh, of a programming language when you're trying to describe software is that uh, they require you to get all of your details right up front. Um, and that process, that mindset, uh, tends to shift our, shift our focus um, onto how we're doing something. Uh, but Gherkin, on the other hand, exists to help you think about what thing you're going to do, uh, why you're going to do it, and who you're going to do it for. Um, I think it's also important to realize that uh, Cucumber is not a tool for doing TDD. Um, Cucumber and test-driven development complement each other nicely, um, but it's been my experience that the two of them work on very different rhythms. Uh, I think of Cucumber as sort of a set of guide rails for TDD, and my workflow uh, for using it goes something like this. Uh, I start with a Cucumber scenario, uh, I run it, and I watch it fail. Uh, I look at the error message to figure out why it failed and use that information to go write a unit test. Uh, I watch the unit test fail, <coughs> make it pass, and refactor. And now at this point I have a choice. Uh, if I know what the next unit test I need to write is, uh, then I do that. I go back around the red-green refactor cycle again, uh, usually a couple of times. But if I'm stuck, if I don't know the next unit test to write, I go back and I run the cucumber test again. And it's probably still failing at that point, but critically, it's, in, it's failing for a different reason. Um, and that usually gives me enough information to go back into the TDD cycle again a couple more times. Uh, and so I, you know, I go th in through the inner circle, hop out, run the cucumber test every once in a while, and then at some point uh, when I run it, it passes. Uh, I do a little dance, uh, do some refactoring, and then move on to the next scenario. When I'm working this way, I spend most of my time uh, in that tight little inner loop doing TDD, red-green refactor. It's got a really nice, fast rhythm to it. Um, and the fact that the tests and the code, in the, uh, the code that's under test, the, the fact that they're both written in the same language makes it really easy to go around that loop very quickly. Uh, sometimes if I'm really in the zone, I'm writing a test uh, every minute or even more, every minute or so, or even a little bit more. Um, and when I'm doing this, I'm focusing on how something works. And this is really good, sort of satisfying, detail-oriented work. Um, but when I start to lose sight of the forest for the trees, um, I jump back up to Cucumber. Uh, and that shift from reading and writing Ruby all the time back to looking at Gherkin uh, helps remind, remind me to get out of that sort of hyper-focused how mode uh, and come back to thinking about what, why, and who. Um, and that then helps me remember what the next thing to do is. It also helps keep me from going too far down a rabbit hole, which is nice. Um, Tom Stewart uh, of the London Ruby User Group uh, wrote something about Cucumber a while back that uh, really resonated with me. He described it as being more like a mind hack than a testing tool uh, because it helps him think about the uh, big picture rather than the details. Um, and as I was putting this talk together, I asked uh, Matt Wynn, who's the co-author of the Cucumber book, uh, if there was anything that he wanted people to know about Cucumber. Uh, he tweeted back that he wished more people knew about Cucumber as a thinking and collaboration tool, and not just something for test automation. Both of these quotes uh, lead back to something that I, I said a few slides ago. Uh, I asserted that Gherkin is not code and that Cucumber is not for TDD. Uh, but negative definitions aren't always the most useful. Um, or to put that another way, a positive definition, definition is much more useful than a negative one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what are these things for? Um, well, I already talked a little bit about how I use Cucumber as guide rails around an inner TDD loop. But let's talk a little bit more about Gherkin. And by the way, everything that I'm saying this talk is my own opinion based on my own experience. Um, I do not speak for anybody on the Cucumber team. Uh, but I think that Gherkin is for describing software uh, at the level of user intent. And you might choose to use Cucumber to turn, turn your Gherkin artifacts into automated tests. Um, I'm going to unpack this a little bit. Uh, by describing software, what I mean is that Gherkin uh, lets you capture acceptance criteria. 
And by acceptance criteria, I mean the system has to do this stuff or you don't get paid. Uh, by user intent, what I mean is that Gherkin paints its picture in broad strokes uh, without getting bogged down in a lot of details. Details are what TDD is all about. Um, I've worked with some scenarios that look kind of like this. Uh, and what I've found is that if I change the new widget link to have different text to make it say, create an awesome widget, then 20 of my tests explode. And then I get to spend you know 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour editing all of them and, and fixing everything just to get all my cucumber tests passing again. Uh, it's not really the best use of my time. Um, so I, I like not to get too specific in cucumber tests. Uh, as for that last bit, uh, just because cucumber is pitched as a tool for writing automated tests, you are not obligated to use it that way. Uh, personally, I think cucumber's greatest tool or greatest value um, comes from Gherkin and using Gherkin as a tool for facilitating conversations between developers and the people who pay us. Um, I've written Gherkin files and thrown them away and felt like my time was very well spent. Um, so this is what I now think Cucumber should be used for, uh, but it took me a long time to figure this out, uh, and I made a lot of mistakes along the way. Some of those mistakes were rather painful, and so in the hope that you can learn from my mistakes, I'm gonna share them with you. Yes, this is the part of the talk where you all get to laugh at me. Oops, and I messed up my animation there. All right, sorry. All right, I'm gonna show you a Cucumber scenario uh, that I helped to write in a real live code base. Uh, and before I push the button here, I wanna reiterate, it is okay to laugh at me for this. I kind of expect you to. Everybody ready? So this thing visited a route that was only of defined and only available in the test environment. Uh, that route rendered a static view uh, that in turn required a JavaScript file, and that JavaScript file contained all of the unit tests for our front-end helper functions. Um, Cucumber would drive the browser to go and look at that. The browser would interpret all the JavaScript and tell us whether all our tests passed or not. Uh, that number 99 actually started uh, all off at somewhere around 40 or 50, uh, but we kept adding more JavaScript tests. So every time we did that, of course, we had to go in and update this Cucumber scenario with the right number. <laughs> so, so how did this happen? Um, <laughs> we had a fairly large Rails project uh, with an extensive Cucumber test suite, um, and we needed to run some tests that was, it was most convenient to run in the browser. And we thought, well, hey, here's this thing that's already set up to, run sel to drive Selenium and run a browser for us. Um, and apparently there were not any grown-ups around to stop us. I'm looking at you, Robbie. Um, here's something else I did in an actual project. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what this did was uh, it would visit the new page for the widgets controller. Uh, it would fill out the form that it got with randomly generated data, it would submit the form, check that it was on a show page and that, was, that the show page was displaying the same data that it had just submitted. Then it would click the edit link, uh, change each value on the edit form, click save, make sure that those changes were visible on the show page. Then it would click delete and make sure that that thing was missing from the list. <laughs> and so to make this work, uh, of course, we had to write something that could automatically mutate values. Uh, and in order to make that work, uh, we added CSS classes to our input uh, forms to indicate that a given field would contain, <clears throat> would contain numbers or names or addresses and so on. But that's just good semantic markup, right? Uh, at least that's what we told ourselves. <laughs> I'm, I, this was actually a lot of fun to write, um, but the problem was that while we were gold plating our cucumber suite, uh, we were avoiding writing actual features that our actual customer actually cared about, and shortly thereafter we were actually fired. <laughs> so don't do this. The only reason you're gonna do this. Well, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I like getting paid. Um, <clears throat> so uh, here's another one. Uh, when you get a bug report, um, it's usually a good idea to add an automated test somewhere in your suite to reproduce that bug so you can prevent any regressions in the future. Um, it is not, however, a good idea to put those tests in Cucumber. Um, 
Gherkin is a really great way for you to tell the story of your application at a fairly high level. Uh, ideally, you can take all of your future files, you can print them out, and you can hand them to a new developer or a new manager on your project. They should be able to read through those in about an hour um, and come away with a good high-level idea of what your software does. Um, and putting a bunch of regression tests in there, cluttering your, your Gherkin files up, turns your Hemingway into Charles Dickens. Um, and it makes it a lot harder to, to figure out what's going on. Um, doing this, by the way, is also a good way to commit the next blunder, which is just plain having too many scenarios. Um, opinions vary on how long is a reasonable time to wait for a test suite. Uh, personally, I'm willing to wait about five minutes, uh, three or four times a day. Uh, but any more than that, and my tests just may as well not be running. Uh, if you do find yourself in this situation, uh, one thing that you could do to mitigate it <coughs> is to, uh, you could consider tagging uh, a critical subset of your tests to run before every commit, and then let your continuous integration server run the, the full suite after you push. So you'll find out eventually if you broke something, um, but at least you'll have a smoke test or two to tell you if everything is completely, uh, completely broken. Uh, another way to commit this blunder of having too many scenarios is to automate every feature that you write. Um, it's perfectly okay to use Gherkin to facilitate a conversation with somebody, and possibly even yourself. Uh, I talk to myself in many languages. Gherkin is one of them. Uh, and then just throw away the feature file once you've learned what you needed to learn from it. If you do feel the need to take that uh, artifact and hang on to it for posterity, you can check it into your features directory, but then you can tag it uh, with FYI or TBD and change your Cucumber configuration so that tests with that tag never get run. So they'll be in there available as documentation for people to read, but uh, Cucumber won't actually try to execute them. Uh, and finally, I have a few things to say about step, de step definitions. Um, there are a lot of ways that these things will make you hate life. Um, if you get the Cucumber book, uh, which as I mentioned, you should, um, it'll tell you to define a bunch of helper functions and then invoke those from your step definitions, uh, and that does help. Um, but I started using Cucumber years before that book was published, uh, which means I've mis made mistakes like uh, having too many step definitions, uh, having huge step definitions, having too many huge step definitions. <laughs> this is one of my favorites, is having step definitions that call other step definitions. Really, I think it's a mistake to have just about any logic whatsoever in a step definition. I really hate these things. So after making all of those mistakes and quite a few more, uh, I found myself feeling really very conflicted about Cucumber. Uh, I really loved the expressiveness of Gherkin and I, I wanted to believe in this idea that programmers and managers could sit down in a room and write, write acceptance tests together in universal harmony and everything would be great. Um, but I struggled to reconcile that with uh, the project that I was working on a couple years ago, which had hundreds of scenarios uh, backed by 750 different step definitions, which all together amassed about 5,000 lines of code. Um, and the entire test suite took 90 minutes to run. Uh, eventually, you know, after sort of having this crisis of faith, I, I found myself asking a really interesting question, which was, how would you write scenarios if you didn't know what the user interface was going to be? I, I assert that if you can tell from reading your Cucumber features, uh, whether you're using a web app or a desktop application or a CLI or something else, you're probably letting too much detail leak into your features. Here's an example of the difference that I'm talking about. Here's another one. So this question, uh, it floated around in my head for a while uh, as I worked on other things. Uh, until once upon a time, uh, I was brought in to work on one part of a rather large monolithic Rails application that calculated salesperson commissions. Now you might hear commissions and think, okay, you add up how much each person told and you multiply that, uh, how much each person sold, excuse me, multiply that by a percentage and you cut a check. Um, but that would be far too simple. Uh, there were usually uh, half a dozen compensation schemes that were active at any one time. Uh, these schemes changed a couple of times a year. Uh, sometimes very dramatically, 
And uh, they were worked out by the sales department at this company, uh, who had put together something like 15 pages of dense, confusing legalese uh, to describe each plan. And then we had to read through those and translate them into some kind of actual requirements that we could maybe then use to d write real code. Um, oh, and by the way, we usually got these after the plans had gone into effect, and it was, you know, there were a couple of weeks left to calculate checks. So that was really awesome. Um, <clears throat> but one of my goals uh, as I worked on this project, I wanted to be able to take, uh, to sort of get the sales department away from giving us these legalese documents. I wanted to sort of give them an, an example of what they could give us instead, you know, some really clear examples of how these things should work. Um, and so I wanted to be able to describe every single aspect of these schemes, uh, even some of the lower level details, uh, using Gherkin. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a simplified, fictionalized version of how just one of these compensation schemes worked. Um, it's really not important for you to catch the details here. The, uh, the specific domain isn't really relevant. Um, I really just wanted to give uh, some concrete examples of how I wrote and organized my features, uh, and this was the easiest way to show that. Uh, so we'll start with the concept of a sales target and a target bonus. Now, this is basically the company saying, if you sell uh, $100,000 worth of widgets in a month, that's the sales target, uh, then we'll pay you $100 over your base salary. Uh, that's the target bonus. Uh, these numbers are in no way realistic, by the way. I just picked them to make it easy to convert between percentages and dollars in my head. Um, so anyway, there's, there's a scaling factor here. Uh, if you miss your target, if you sell 75000 instead of 100, you you're going to get paid less than the $100. Um, and if you exceed your target, you're going to get paid more, uh, which so far so good. But there's a little catch. And the catch is this little thing called a pay curve. Uh, the pay curve is a, a simple function. Uh, you put in what percentage of your sales target you hit, and you get back what percentage of your target bonus you're going to get paid. Uh, now, to describe the pay curve, uh, this was awesome. Uh, the sales department actually gave us a spreadsheet uh, with example rows for every possible integer value from 0 to 250. Now, this actually turned out to be really nice because since it was in a spreadsheet already, um, it took you know, a minute to add a chart to the spreadsheet so that I, I, I could actually see the curve. And looking at the chart shows that this is a piecewise linear function. Um, and that helped me wrap my head around what was, what was happening so I could figure out like where the inflection points were. So back to the spreadsheet. Uh, and from there, it was really straightforward to convert that spreadsheet into a cucumber table and use that to drive a scenario outline. Uh, if you're not familiar with this feature of, of Gherkin, uh, a scenario outline is basically a template for a scenario followed by a table. The table gets executed one, or uh, pardon me, the template gets executed once for each row in the table, and the values from the appropriate column get filled in wherever you use a placeholder value. This is a really nice way of running a bunch of tests that have the same form. Now, because I knew that this was a piecewise linear function, uh, I was able to get away with not taking all 251 rows of the spreadsheet and putting them into a giant cucumber table. Um, I put in uh, a few points, a few examples around each of those inflection points to make sure I got the, the boundaries right. Um, <clears throat> and once that was working, I moved on to implementing the rest of the compensation scheme. Um, <coughs> excuse me. At first glance, uh, this looks remarkably similar to the scenarios for the pay curves. And when I first wrote this, I, I felt kind of bad about it, like I was repeating myself. But on reflection, I realized it actually introduced quite a few new concepts. Um, there were compensation schemes, the idea that there was more than one of those in effect. Um, it describes sales target and target bonus in dollars instead of in percentages. Um, and then you get your actual sales and your bonus amounts also in dollars. Uh, so with those concepts in place, I was then able to uh, describe the next feature of this scheme, which is a safety net. And I promise this is the last part of this that I'm going to talk about. Um, the safety net is a feature uh, that's designed to help out new hires as they're getting up to speed for the first couple of months. Uh, this is basically a guarantee that you're always going to get paid at least the amount of your target bonus. Uh, if you don't hit your sales target, we'll kick in the difference uh, so you don't go hungry. Uh, and if you do better than your sales target, we'll pay more 
than your target bonus. But uh, this is a guarantee that at least until we take the safety net away, you're never going to make less than uh, your target. So anyway, um, <clears throat> I think that's enough to give a sense for how I organized and wrote the Gherkin features for this project. Um, I do want to talk about uh, a, a sometimes underutilized element of uh, Gherkin's grammar. Uh, I left this out on earlier slides uh, so that I can make the text bigger. Um, but Gherkin gives you some space at the top of the file uh, where you can write whatever you want. Um, some of the examples and tutorials for Cucumber that I've seen uh, show that space being used for as a, I want, so that. Um, but in practice, I find that people tend to fill in that template without really thinking about it. <laughs> so sometimes I just skip this part. Um, but for this project, uh, I use that space to provide some context about why this feature exists um, or what makes this aspect of the plan that I'm describing interesting in comparison to other features that may be similar to it. Um, and for this scheme, I was particularly worried that the examples of how the safety net worked in specific cases might not fully explain what that aspect of the scheme was for or why it was there. Um, so I just took a few lines to explain it using the simplest language that I could. Um, and after I handed this project off, uh, one of the bits of feedback uh, that I got from the other developers who were working on it was that this documentation in particular um, was extremely helpful in making sense of these, frankly, ridiculous compensation schemes. But so this is the sort of thing that you may overlook if you're trying to, to treat Gherkin as a programming language. Uh, because if you're thinking of Gherkin as code, then this whole section of the file just feels like a big block comment. And we all love comments, right? Um, but if you're thinking about Gherkin as a medium for communicating with other people about your project, then this freeform text area can be really useful because it gives you a place to talk about things without having to sort of cram your explanation into this step-by-step, -step, this happens, this happens, this happens. And the last thing that I want you to notice about these features is that absolutely every word of this is expressed in terms of the domain, not the interface. Uh, if you sat down and you read through all of these features, uh, you would learn a lot, probably more than you wanted to learn, about how this organization thinks uh, that it can motivate its, its salespeople. Um, but you're not going to have any idea what kind of app they're using to do it. So let's talk a little bit about the architecture that I settled on for the application. And this actually does tie back into the, the Cucumber bits. Um, I chose to use Rails for this, uh, but I wanted to try a slightly more disciplined approach than I usually see in Rails apps. Uh, so I organized the code into three main layers. Uh, the user interface is standard Rails controllers and views, nothing interesting there. Uh, the UI layer talks to a mix of active record objects and a couple of service objects. Uh, and that layer, in turn, talks to a set of plain old Ruby objects, or poor rows. And those model the rules for the compensation schemes themselves. Um, this is slightly weird for Rails, but it's nothing earth shattering. Um, if you want to explore those ideas a little bit more, if they're not already familiar to you, uh, Bob Martin gave a talk in 2011 called Architecture of the Lost Years. Um, and personally, I found this talk really hard to watch um, because I felt uh, a lot of his rhetorical techniques detracted from the, the important things that he had to say. Um, but if you can sort of look past his style, he has, he has some really interesting ideas in there. Um, and while I was working on this sales commission project, I also ran across uh, a really, really good presentation that Jim Weirich gave to Cincinnati RB called Decoupling from Rails. Um, this is a good talk, uh, talk with some good solid ideas in it, uh, pun intended. And uh, it's well worth watching just for the main topic. But right at the very end of the video, after he finished the talk and after he was done with his Q&A, Jim said something really interesting, and I've just realized that I haven't plugged in the sound. So let's see if this works. Don't plug the sound in. Do I get sound? I don't get sound. Fortunately, I also added captions to this. Let me tell you a goal that I have. You can do integration testing I don't, coming in sorry. at this level and test all the way down to the database and back. That runs pretty doggone fast. The only thing you're not testing is the controllers, the webby stuff, the views, and things. Um, I would like to demonstrate that if you do your cucumber tests right, you could run your cucumber tests at this level or throw a switch.
and run it at this level. So if you want fast integration tests, you can run them here. If you want complete include the web integration tests, you can run them at this level. I think that would be an interesting experiment. Now, when I heard Jim say that, um, I just about fell out of my chair because that was exactly what I was doing in this project. Um, now, unfortunately for me, I never met Jim, uh, so I never didn't get a chance to talk to him about this interesting experiment, but I got to write a talk about it and share it with you, so that's fun. Um, my initial idea was basically what Jim had described. Uh, using the tagging feature of Cucumber, uh, I wanted to be able to mark a scenario as being UI or model or possibly both. And uh, the scenarios that were tagged with UI would use Capybara to interact with the full Rails stack in the way that most people think about using Cucumber with Rails. Um, but the scenarios that were tagged with model would run directly against the active record layer um, and so that they could be faster. And that active record layer would exercise the pros indirectly. And I thought when I started out that that would be good enough. Um, but I discovered very quickly that the PoRo layer was complicated enough on its own that I didn't want to have to think about the relational data model at the same time. So almost immediately, I added a core tag as well. Uh, here's how that played out in one of the feature files that I showed earlier. Uh, once I'd written a scenario, I would start by tagging it with the name of the layer that I wanted to run it at, plus a whip suffix to indicate that it was work in progress. <clears throat> I'd run the scenario and watch it fail. From there, I'd drop down to RSpec and do the usual small, fast TDD cycles until the scenario passed. Uh, once it was passing, I'd remove the whip suffix because it was, it was okay now. Then if I wanted to reuse that scenario at the next layer up, um, I'd add another tag for that layer plus the whip suffix again. <clears throat> so I'd start at core, get it working in core, then move up to the model layer. Um, and again, I'd write a bunch of RSpec tests until I got the same scenario passing at the new higher layer uh, at which point I'd remove the whip suffix from that layer as well. So that was how I wanted to approach this from the Gherkin side of things, uh, but it took me a while to figure out a good way to implement it using Cucumber. Um, I wanted, my initial idea was to have Cucumber run all of the core scenarios with one set of step definitions in place, then run all of the model scenarios with a completely different set of step definitions, and then run all of the UI scenarios with a third set of step definitions. Um, I did this at first by manipulating Cucumber's load path, uh, and this was kind of painful, but it basically worked once I, once I figured out the, the command line syntax for it. Uh, but the problem that I ex experienced with this was that any time I changed the wording of a step, I had to edit three different regular expressions in three different files and make sure they all agreed with each other, uh, which, yeah, really sucked. Uh, so instead, I wound up consolidating down to one set of step definitions that invoked something that, for want of a better term, I just called the step driver. Doing this um, has the wonderful effect of making step definitions small and simple. Um, and with this change, I was then able to define three different step drivers to interface with each layer of my application. And I put all three of them on the same load path and just used an environment variable to decide which step driver to instantiate. So you would call step driver and you would get one of three different kinds back and it would, it would do the same thing. Now further details on, on how I accomplished this are beyond the scope of this talk. But uh, if you're curious and you want to try this, um, talk, to me, talk to me later. There was some fun stuff in there. Um, so that's... That's all the new ideas uh, that, I was playing, that I was playing with, um, but I have a, a couple of observations about how this all worked. Um, first off, I have a bit of, of advice to give anybody who's working with Cucumber, um, and this comes directly from my inner five-year-old. Uh, the step definitions are lava. <laughs> because of the way Cucumber works, uh, the step definitions have to be there, um, but in my opinion, they should be a very thin adapter between Gherkin steps and some sort of custom driver for automating your application. Um, ideally, a step definition should be one annoyingly obvious line of code. Um, and the reason I went with a step driver instead of just plain helper functions like the Cucumber book um, would advise is that step definitions, um, they exist in this kind of PHP style flat namespace with one global scope for sharing variables between them. Um, and moving all of the interesting logic out of there and into a step driver, let me use Ruby's full object-oriented toolset to organize and refactor my code. Uh, 
Um, and it let me keep the step definitions themselves so simple that I never had to think about them. Um, if I wanted to say the same thing two different ways in my Gherkin files, it's really easy to take one of these, copy paste it, and just change the regular expression to match whatever. Um, and uh, overall, this, this approach worked so well for me that I, if I were going to use this on a new project, um, I would write a step driver to work with my uh, cucumber step definitions, even if I wasn't going to use this multi-layered approach. Um, also, these, uh, these commissions plans, um, as I mentioned, they, they involved something like 15 pages of legalese, which I then had to translate into code. Uh, and that was just too complicated for me to hold even a, a small portion of it in my head all at once. Uh, what I found was that breaking the problem down across architectural layers uh, allowed me to focus on just the core logic. And then once I had that working, figure out how to adapt that to active record so that I could persist the results that I was interested in. And then once I had that working, move up to the user interface and fill that in once, once everything else was, was OK. Um, and looking back at it, this was probably the only way that I could have completed this particular app uh, in any reasonable amount of time. So I, I was very happy with how that turned out as well. Uh, some scenarios I only tagged at one level, and some of them I tagged at two. Uh, in practice, it turned out that the ones that ran at more than one layer, they always ran at two adjacent layers. Uh, so they would run at core and model, or model and UI. But I, in practice, I never had a single scenario that ran at both core and UI. Um, I think this is just because I had some features that described uh, lower level concepts like that pay curve, that piecewise linear function. Um, and those never showed up directly in the user interface. They just affect the numbers that you get. Uh, so it would make sense <clears throat> to describe those concepts at the core and model layers. Um, and I still got a lot of value from describing those concepts in Gherkin. Uh, but by the time I made it up to the user interface, they just weren't worth mentioning anymore. Um, the developers who took the project over from me, uh, they were not as enthusiastic about this Cucumber setup as I was. Uh, they were very not enthusiastic, in fact. Um, but they did say things after they'd worked with it for a while, like, yeah, I can see why you did it that way. Um, <laughs> not that they would, but they could see why I did. Um, and they also said things like, it was really nice to have such clear documentation about what these business terms meant. So I'm just going to round that up to a win. Uh, I do have to talk about performance, though. Uh, at at uh, Cascadia RubyConf in 2011, uh, Ryan, Ga Ryan Davis uh, gave a talk called Size Doesn't Matter, uh, in which he talked about the speed and relative size of various testing frameworks in Ruby. Um, Cucumber shows up in like nine different slides in Ryan's slide deck, and they basically all look like this. Uh, in every single metric that Ryan chose to present in this talk, uh, Cucumber came in dead last, uh, sometimes with a nice embarrassing annotation like 60,000 lines of C. Um, and when I saw this talk, you know, I laughed and I winced because at the time I was working on that 90-minute test suite. Um, and so when I started this project, uh, I was fully expecting to pay uh, a huge performance penalty. So with that in mind, here are the numbers uh, from this project. Um, I had 64 scenarios tagged with core. That, why would you keep using Cucumber? Like, you can write the documentation without Cucumber. <sighs> okay, so I hear two different questions in there. Indeed. Uh, one question, you, okay, so one question is uh, if you're going to use Cucumber, and I'm, I'm, one question is if you're going to use Cucumber but not use the multi-layered approach that I did, would it still be worthwhile to use a step, to, a step driver? Is that a fair summation of the one half of your question? Yeah. OK. Um, that's really my personal preference. Um, I found that it was so difficult to work with code that was locked inside the blocks that are associated with Cucumber step definitions, um, especially if those things needed to interact with each other, uh, like if I wanted to compose smaller steps into a bigger step, for example. Um, I found it so difficult to work with code inside those blocks that I wanted it out of there as soon as possible anyway. And there, you could totally get away with just using a single um, layer of you know, top-level help, helper functions like you uh, have in the Cucumber book, right? Um, I would use a step driver because I'm familiar with that and I'm comfortable with it. I wouldn't expect anybody else to. Um, is that a fair answer? The other question that I heard you say wa ask was, if you're, gonna, if you're not going to be doing the multi-layer approach, um, it's been your experience that stakeholders don't give a shit about uh, 
certainly your step definitions, but also your Gherkin files themselves. So and anything to do with code. Anything right? to do with code at all, right? <laughs> um, and so is it still worth using, using Cucumber then? Um, a lot, sort of the classical answer to that is that Cucumber is, is best for having conversations between developers and stakeholders and ideally QA as well is in on that conversation because those are three very different perspectives and Gherkin provides you a nice common language for all those, th all those people to speak without anybody being too uncomfortable with it. Um, if you're not going to have those conversations outside those boundaries, um, Cucumber may not be as worthwhile. Um, that said, uh, I did have an experience once where I was pairing with somebody and I was trying to, you know, I'd been working on this thing for a day and I was trying to explain what I was doing and I was doing a tour through the code and, and after like half an hour of me fumbling through it, he was like, stop. Let's go write a, 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 a Gherkin file and you tell me like what this is supposed to do. And this was another developer, mind you. Um, and so I sat down and we spent 10 minutes writing that. And he said, okay, now I understand. Let's throw this away and let's go back to what we were doing. So I, I personally think that Gherkin has more value than it's given credit for, but it's up to you whether you want to use it or not. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So I have something that I would just add to that. Was in my experience that taking off your developer hat and putting on your user hat is yeah. helpful and that using Cucumber forces you to do that. Yeah. Thank you. That's the mind hack that Tom Stewart was talking about. So, Dana. I fully agree. Any other questions? All right, thanks.